everyone for being here. Uh, thank you so much. It is such an honor to present this seminar. Um, I see a lot of new faces in this room, which is really exciting uh, for all of us because this was a seminar um, that we really wanted to present to the next generation of amazing bartenders and the next generation who's going to be the movers and shakers in this industry. And we thank you for being here and taking time out of your day and your busy schedule to choose our seminar. Um, obviously, Tell the Cocktail is an incredible opportunity for you to learn, for you to have opportunities to engage with people. So really, take advantage of this week. It's an amazing week. Um, we have all been to Tales many, many, many times, and we've learned so much and made many lasting you know, relationships and business deals and all these wonderful things. So thank you for being here at uh, something that we really feel is important. Thank you to our sponsors. It's really important because those, those are the people who help us present this information to you. Um, so today we have our three sponsors from Diageo. We have Zacapa Rum and actually Lorena Vasquez, our master blender is here. Uh, Tanqueray who made the lovely 50-50 cocktail that you had as you walked in and Crown Royal. So. These are brands, innovation, big companies that we hope to someday maybe become a part of. <laughs> so, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I have an incredible panel today. Um, so these are people who I call my friends, my colleagues. They're people I learn from every day in my own personal business. So I'm really excited to have them here to present. Um, so I'm going to have them introduce themselves just in case you live in a bubble and don't know who any of these people are. Um, so <laughs> first up is uh, Charles Dooley. And everyone's Twitter handles are there, so you can follow everyone as well. Oh, hello. Hey. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Uh, I'm Charles Jolie. Um, and it, when we get back into it, I'm going to be talking about kind of my latest project and, and one that was the most far reaching for me, which was uh, launching my own brand, my own retail brand. But uh, this will be my 18th year in the industry uh, in, the, in terms of bars, restaurants. Uh, and, and I really have done it all. And I think you'll see crossover in all of our experiences. Uh, inevitably, if you're a bartender, you're probably going to do some brand work. Inevitably, if you're a bartender that, that people think is doing something of value, you're going to end up doing some consulting. Uh, and, um, and I think we're a creative group to begin with. And so we probably all have a million ideas for a million businesses uh, for needs that we see in the world. Uh, and sometimes we, we take those ideas and run with them, which is what happened uh, in, in my case with uh, Craft House cocktails um, and, and one of the many projects that uh, that I've got uh, w that I'm working on currently and that I hope to give you some insight uh, into because I think what this t today is also about is um, learning from other people's mistakes learning from our mistakes and our experience to save yourself time to save yourself headache and money and, and everything that goes along with it so you can kind of fast track on to wherever it is that you'd like your career path to go uh, Charles is also being extremely modest. He is the very first uh, world-class USA champion. So he took the world. So yeah. Charles, thank you for bringing it home. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to get the same type of applause as I'm uh... <laughs> But Ryan's the most important person in the room to know. <laughs> uh, I'm a lawyer, so I don't think I'm going to get any applause. But uh, my name is Ryan Malkin, and uh, I'm an attorney in the alcohol beverage industry. Um, I have a practice that I assist brands of all sizes, both big um, and small, get started in the alcohol beverage industry and try to navigate the state-by-state -state compliance and how, how do you work on distribution agreements, sales agreements, um, bottling agreements, whatever it is that you need. Uh, I was formerly in-house counsel at Pernod Ricard, so I worked on all of those brands uh, with the sales and marketing teams. And um, years before that, I was also a journalist, and I... Uh, interviewed Lynette many times for a lot of different projects. Um, so I've been in the industry for a number of years, uh, first as a journalist and, and now as an attorney, and I look forward to speaking to you today. My name is Gabe Orta. I'm from Miami. I, I also, like Charles, have uh, been in the industry for about 15 years, done every job from dishwasher, bar back, you name it. And, uh, and work uh, as a bartender and, and love and, and start learning about this craft. And from ever since then, the, the goal was to open a bar. It was kind of like a dream. And um, so it took a lot, of, a lot of mistakes, a lot of things to do over, meeting investors, collecting money. So it's a little bit what we'll talk about it, how to do it right, how to have your business plan. And, you know, and how to, and like Charles says, like you're a brand and how to like 
pursue many different projects that you want to do at once. It's all about multitasking and how do you present yourself as a bartender, as a brand, as an owner. So yeah, we're very excited. <laughs> All right, so the basic idea is, you know, you've spent many, many years in your bars, honing your craft, you're in like every trade magazine, you're the hottest thing going on. You're like, awesome, I've made so much money for my bosses. So <laughs> what am I gonna get out of it? What am I gonna do? There are so many different opportunities, so many different places to go, and we're all presented with those opportunities. You have regulars coming in being like, hey, are you gonna open your own bar? But they didn't bring an investment check. So there's a lot of different things you can do. I'm sure at, the, at that point you have brands knocking on your door because they want people with a great reputation within the trade and within the media uh, to represent their brands. Why wouldn't they? You are the gatekeepers, you are the people who know how to use their products daily. So they want to tap into that. Maybe you're like, oh man, I've got this awesome idea. I'm going to make like the first ever like never get hung over thing, which would be amazing. But you don't know how to start these things. You don't know how to get where you're going. So this whole presentation for the next hour and a half is going to be presenting different options, talking to you about the business of yourself, how you uh, present yourself, project yourself within this industry, and finding a path. Um, we are extremely fortunate that this is now a time where bartending is taken seriously. You can become a, you know, your parents can no longer be disappointed that you didn't become a lawyer, unlike Ryan, uh, and, and that you actually have a job that can be a profession that can be a career. And that's what we hope to share with you guys today. And we've all taken extremely different paths. Um, so I'm going to get started. So first, uh, our cocktail. Well, this is the brand ambassador. So this is this is the fun part. You will meet many of these people all week long. Uh, you know, this this is like our extreme version. They're like in all of the swag. They've got it all. Like you can read it on their face. Like, hey, I know you. I'll be wearing a Zacapa backpack, so you'll find me uh, most of the time. Uh, but these are the people who are the face of the brands. They're out meeting you, getting placements in your bars, and becoming that person that you look to for inspiration, for ideas, uh, for how to use these products. But just they're all around good people, too. So don't hate on brand ambassadors. Their job can be very hard sometimes. <laughs> um, so the first cocktail we have is presented by Tanqueray. I think we wanted to go with some serious cocktails. This is serious business, and nothing says business like an awesome gin martini. And Fitty Fitty, I love it because it's, it's your way. You can be like, yeah, I'm drinking a really stiff drink, but have a little more vermouth to balance you out. So cheers to our first cocktail of the day, for me at least. Uh, to everyone else who, if it's your first grave, if it's your third, cheers. Um, pace yourself, because they're all strong and stirred today. So my name is Lynette Marrero. Um, I have just some logos there, just some of the things that I've done in, in my career. Um, I am the co-founder of an organization called Speed Rack, which is an all-women's uh, bartending competition that has now gone global. We have some of my Canadian girls here. Um, and that's it's been really exciting. It's been the last four years of my life have been building a company, and it's really hard. Um, but that's what we've been doing. I also um, branched into the business side uh, after being in bars and working with brands. So I'm currently the national mixologist for Perrier and San Pellegrino, um, so Nestle Waters, and I am the trade ambassador for Zacapa Rum, which actually we're going to talk a little bit about that today and have some cocktails later. But my journey was very different. So I started in 2004 working for Julie Reiner, who is Everyone knows Julie Reiner. She's awesome. She has a new book out. Please get it. Um, and she, she really taught me a lot about business. Uh, Flatiron Lounge opened in 2003. I started there in 2004 after stalking Julie for a year. Uh, my, my friend, I was working at a martini lounge across town, um, maybe just a few blocks. And you know our cocktails were chocolate martinis and key lime pie martinis. Everything was a martini. And I was cocktail waitressing there and starting to learn the bar. And my friend Amber and I would go every night, because they were open till four, and we'd go into this bar and you'd walk through and there's this beautiful art deco music playing, this gorgeous room, and these three glamazons working there, these, I'm short, it's these tall, tall women who are running their bar. They're working behind their bar. And this was Julie Reiner, Sue Fedroff, who um, does all of the business and opens all of the bars. Uh, she is incredibly talented. Go see their seminar later this week. And uh, Michelle Connolly. And these women were, inspirations to me. They were 
incredibly, they knew their product, they knew what they had to do, they knew that it was gonna take two years behind the stick of your own bar before you branched down, were able to bring people in. So I had a really awesome opportunity to start with Julie in 2004 as a cocktail waitress. And what I did while I was in that, oh wow, hello. Uh, what I did while I was in that position was, um, I took an opportunity to learn as much as I could. So I had desires to be behind the bar, but I knew I didn't know enough about what they were doing in this bar. So my first order of business was to learn as much as I could about this amazing fresh ingredient cocktails every moment. So we had a, a flight program, and that flight program every day changed. And so every shift, there'd be three new cocktails. Now I could have just been the cocktail waitress who was like, oh, whatever, I'm just serving these drinks, whatever, who cares? I took time to ask the bartenders what was in each cocktail, how to prepare it, and so that way I would know, and I'd write those down, and I had that information. So over the course of the two years that I worked at Flatiron, I learned every drink, and I had people like Dale DeGroff and Audrey Saunders, they were all rolling through the bar, and I took any opportunity I had to learn from those people. So lesson number one, learn from all of your mentors. Anyone who walks to that bar, listen to them, learn from them, learn from your guests, because they're gonna help propel you into your next career. I left Flatiron um, to start bartending. I worked, at, I bartended at Flatiron. Julie actually gave me an opportunity. And then I left to go work in restaurant bars. And I worked at a place called Freeman's in New York, which was kind of the one of the first like super hip uh, gastro pubs that had two killer bars in the space. And it was really busy and a great place. I met lots of people coming through. It was an opportunity to meet so many brands. And the very first person who sat at my bar who I met was Rob Cooper, uh, who created Saint Germain. And what a brand that is. I mean, it's become such an iconic brand. And he kind of interviewed me over the bar and hired me to run events for him uh, in New York. And there, was, there were these crazy events, and my job was quality control of all the catering bartenders. And then to make sure that the, the VIP bartenders, who were all the good bartenders in the world, were working the other bar. So it was a really unique position. I had never done it before. And I was like, okay, this is cool. I'm gonna manage these people, quality control. I'm there to make sure that Rob's product tastes as great as it can be, and if you've ever met Rob Cooper, he is perfectionist. That's why the product is was what it is today. Um, and that was my first adventures in brand ambassador work. It was part time and it was really, really cool. I got to meet people. I got to learn a lot about how you present yourself. I got to do some media uh, for him as well. And then I started consulting at this point. So because of those connections I made, people would come into my restaurant. Um, there was a new bar restaurant opening that from a celebrity chef, a place called Elataria, and it opened in 2008. And I had the opportunity to work with, it was my first consulting job. I was really scared. I was like, oh my God, what if I fail? What if like no one likes my drinks? I have, there's so much work to do. There's inventory lists to prep. There's all of these things. There's creative ideas. It goes beyond so many, beyond so many things. Um, so I asked Brian Miller of Tiki Miller Mondays, and um, Brian Miller, we co-cocktail created, which was really weird. So the first thing was people were like, what do you mean there's two people consulting on this program? I'm like, yeah, there's two people. Like, it's me and Brian. We both created the drinks. Maybe some drinks are his, maybe some drinks are mine, but we have collaborated to present a program for you. Um, as most things happened at this time, it was a really bad financial situation in, in the U.S., People were eating at home, but drinking still. So the bar was making all of the money in the space. The high-end food from the celebrity chef was not. So as things go, the chef got jealous. We all break up. I am having, I'm like, oh, this is the worst thing. My first consulting job, like, what do I do? But I got written up in the New York Times. Where am I gonna go? And I sat at Death & Company, um, where Brian Miller was working. I'm seeing the service bar area, and I'm really bummed. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I, I left like this awesome restaurant job at Freeman's where I was making so much money and like, what's my next path? I don't know. And Jim Meehan happened to walk in because he was of our PDT and walked in. He's like, hey, Linda, what's up? I'm like, I am super bummed. Just broke up with the chef. And, he's, and he says to me, he's like, hey, there's this opportunity. I don't know if you're interested in it, but there's uh, Zacapa rum, this rum that's launching in the US needs a brand ambassador. I'm like, okay, cool. I don't really know what that entails, but I'll go for an interview. So Jim introduced me um, to, to the people at Diageo and I had several interviews with the agency 
and I was lucky enough to be hired, which was awesome. Uh, and I got to go down to Guatemala and spend time with Lorena and learn about um, the production. And it was, it was amazing. It was the very first time I had ever been in that kind of world. And this was a full-time job. So this is like my first real grown-up full-time job at 27. Um, and that's where it, it was kind of interesting. You're like, all right, here we go. <laughs> and so I started working there and I stayed full-time within the job uh, for just under two years. And I learned a lot. Like the business behind brand ambassador work is very different and know that the part of going out, having your expense account, taking people to dinner and being like, hey, let's all drink rum, isn't it amazing, is one part of that job. The rest of it is spreadsheets. The rest of it is collating your receipts, numbering them and sending them. Sorry, they're still late. But that's you're constantly being like, oh, I'll get everything there. And it's a lot of hard work. It's also getting up for distributor meetings and doing things like GSMs, which I had no idea what that was when I started. So a general sales meeting, you're at 9 AM with like a room this big with people constantly on their phone you know, sending orders. At that time, it was Blackberries. Uh, you know, answering their customers' email, and you're like, "Hey, I want to tell you about this amazing rum. I want you guys to know." And they're like, "Couldn't care less." Um, there's also other challenges. You know, if you're working on a smaller brand, and Zacapa is still a smaller brand within a big company, when you work with distributors, it's a very, it's a really different relationship. You're used to being in charge of that relationship. You know, they walk in, they want something from you now as bartenders. Later on, you need them because they're the, they're the activation army in the field and you're trying to get a placement somewhere and if they don't like you, you kind of have a hard time. But there's also things where, you know, my first experience with brands was with Saint Germain and it was a very narrow focus. It's like, we are just Saint Germain. And what I didn't understand with being a bigger company, distributors don't just have my brand. They have a whole list of brands, even within the portfolio. So there were things would happen where, you know, you had to kind of figure it out, like, I was, you know, it's a, and it's also a very male-dominated situation. So I'd be in these places, and they'd be like, "Hey, we're gonna order a bunch of Kettle One." And I'd be like, "Oh, but I'm Zacapa. I'm supposed to buy Zacapa drinks. Why are you ordering these things?" And it would, you know, and I'd try and bring it up, and then I was looked down upon because they're like, Shh, "Just, you know, just we're in the account. Just do what I'm telling." Like, so it was a hard structure for me to get used to, um, and so I actually decided that. I was better off working on the things that I'm really good at with brands, which is the creative side. I wanted to get back into the world of working on drinks, not dealing with sales, not dealing with that part of the business, because there are people who are way better at it than I am. And that was not the creative part, and I needed to leave. So uh, it was a great relationship, and I stayed working with Sakapa because I did good work. Um, and that's the part, like always leave a job gracefully. However you do it, you know, agree to disagree and say, you know, I'm going to move on, but I will give the proper notice, number one, give proper notice, and I will go work with you in the future. So I stayed working consulting for Zacapa Rum. Anytime they needed something for trade or media, they would call me if they needed new drinks, and it was a wonderful relationship. Um, and I just came back, uh, this is now just two years that I've been back as more of a part-time um, brand ambassador for them with trade and this is now they're one of my clients so what I started was my own company the first company I started was called drinks at six which is my name that I use that's an LLC which we'll get into the legal things and ways you format uh, that was the first thing I did because that's what someone told me to do um, my accountant prefers S cores uh, so I started another company called Bullets and Bustles, and that's now my official s -Corp company that everything goes through, but I still use the LLC name um, because that's what I built my reputation on, and that's what I, I want it. Plus, Bullets and Bustles, maybe not the... It's kind of fun, but I don't think it's legal. I think legal would have a little issues with that as the brand name. Um, so so I did that, and I, and I was able to then continue consulting. So I... Um, I worked on a couple of menus with um, Jim Kearns, who is an awesome guy. Their bar, The Happiest Hour, was nominated this year in the top ten. And he and I opened a few bars, one of the bar, um, and I would consult while I was, while I was doing brand work. Um, and we would do our co-menu. by. So we did Rye House, which was a great whiskey program doing all American spirits. And we did a bar that never officially opened called Woodson and Ford. Um, and that... It was a private bar that everyone would just text me to get into. It was like the coolest New York speakeasy because we were not technically allowed to open because the woman who hired us never told the owner she was hiring people and opening the bar. So eventually that closed. <laughs> But you can still Google it. We got great press, and we just trademarked that name. So maybe someday in the future, I will have a bar called Woodson and Ford with Jim Kearns. Um, but 
I've created a lot of unique opportunities and I say one of the hardest things about being in the position that I'm in is um, really until Speed Rack really took off, I didn't have one central project to refer people to and people don't understand. You're like, hey, I do everything. I'm, I'm doing this, I work on brands, I do this. They're like, no, but where do you work? I'm like, well, I don't work someplace because I would be a horrible person to employ. I am traveling all the time. I would be the person who shifts your all covering and at doing bar management work and being the head bartender, I'd be like, I would hate myself. So I would be like, where is this person? Why are they not in this bar? So I didn't, I didn't think it was fair to be in a bar. So now I just consult and a lot of the times I'll be at a bar uh, for the first month and I'll be doing check, but I, I will not be on a, a bar schedule because it's just not fair and, and it's okay. It's the life I've chosen to be this nomad and be this entrepreneur and to have my own company. But that media doesn't get it. Marketing doesn't get it. It's very, you know, that's when they give us terms like mixologist, you know, because that's like the generic term to be like, you don't actually work anywhere anymore, but you make drinks. <laughs> So get used to it, you know, we all, we all hate the term, but it's just the little button that makes people um, understand. So I think we're gonna get into now just a little bit of the, um, the things to do, legal, legal situations that pop up when working with brands. And um, you guys may have questions about some things, but we're gonna do questions at the end. So please uh, take notes about any of the legal stuff, because I know that's the stuff I have the most questions about all of the time. And I'm gonna turn most of this over to Ryan now. Okay, um, a, qu a question for everybody. Uh, who owns a bar or has an interest in a bar? And of those people whose hands were raised, who also works as a brand ambassador for a liquor company? So a couple. Um, now, first, let me step back and preface this. This is just um, my own, it's, it's all for educational purposes it's in specific legal advice. That's my little disclaimer. Um, but technically speaking, in most states, and depending on the company, you're not supposed to work. Oh, just a little, because. Whoever's Hello? blaring oh, there over there okay. is uh, <laughs> a I think big mouth in the next room like, is overshadowing. Um, <laughs> technically speaking, you're not supposed to work for a liquor company while at the same time uh, having an interest in a bar. It obviously is dependent on the state in terms of if the state's going to look into it or not, but let's just say that's the technical rule. So that's why a lot of times a, a brand will hire a bartender or somebody who has an interest in a bar as a consultant to make specific drinks for a specific event or come down for a specific event. So that was the idea um, behind that and why there's a difference if you're trying to get into a brand ambassador role. Think about it um, if you have a, a bar. And just to interject, so that's why now, because I have my company and I'm not working behind a bar, I can work for different brands. And, and clearly one of my brands is a water brand. That doesn't matter. There's not the same rules for liquor as, as there are for non-alcoholic um, products. Right, so if you, sorry to just take a step back. Uh, if you weren't aware, the alcohol beverage rules are very complicated. And um, basically after prohibition, all of these rules came in. and. We have the TTB rules, that are the federal rules, and then each state has their own rules to comply with for sales, marketing, and basically everything we do. So it can be very complicated, especially on a national scale. Um, so we can skip to the This we talked about, oh, oh, I want to be I go back. No, that's fine. So it was just a question of whether or not you could, you could work for a brand by all, and also have an interest in a bar. And obviously the answer is no, especially in New York, they've made it very, very clear, and a lot of brand, um, brands want to have a presence in New York. So if you do want to work in New York, then you should talk to a, an attorney or something like that if you have a bar. Okay, so this was just a very, very basic version of where we are at in terms of the alcohol beverage rules in the US. Um, the idea from all these rules is that you want to avoid the, the pre-prohibition evils with everybody drinking and getting drunk and spending all of your money on booze instead of um, food for your family and so forth. But um, Obviously, you want to keep the, crim the criminal element out, and the TTB makes sure that all of the product is safe by checking the labels. So if you're going to create a brand, which we're going to talk about label later, then you have to have the formula reviewed and the label reviewed by the government. All of these things and all of the regulations are ultimately to protect the consumer. Now, again, just for, um, th does anybody have any idea what uh, slotting fees are? No. One guy, okay, excellent. So we have one person. Um, let me just quickly run through then the federal rules for alcohol beverage and why they're so important to know, both on the brand side because you're gonna potentially be taking things from brands, uh, or rather on the bartender side when you're taking things from brands, as well as if you do get into owning your own brand, you need to know this before you get into it. 
uh, there's basically inducement, exclusion, and then interstate commerce uh, to c have a federal violation. The interstate commerce part just cut it out because everything's sold within interstate commerce, the product's coming in from another state, whatever, so that one's out. Inducement is basically, uh, you can leave it there, giving a thing of value to a bar. So a thing of value is anything that the regulations say is not permissible. Think of it like this, you can never give anything to a bar or bartender, ever, stop. Well, except if we say these things are permissible. So you can give like the, thing, the napkin, caddies, bar mats, all the things that you usually get, but all of those things are exceptions to the general rule of you can never give anything of value to a bar. Um, the second part in the federal rules is the exclusion element, which is to the exclusion of another brand. So I can't give you something for your bar to the exclusion of her bar. Um, in some states, they don't even care about the exclusion. Like in New York and Florida, all you need to do is give something, and that's the end of the story. You have a potential violation. The important part really is if you give money for anything, which is what everybody wants to do to get your product either placed on a menu or a back bar, then that's a slotting fee and all of a sudden you have a potential violation. Of course, all of this sounds very scary. It's just whether or not your brand is willing to take the risk of not getting caught because the enforcement is um, potentially spotty in some states. So, you know, a lot of things happen and, and a lot of people don't get in trouble because nobody necessarily looks into it. But theoretically, those are what you need, the rules you should know. And note, uh, Texas is a really tough state on things like this. Texas um, and California are probably, Texas, California, and New York are probably the worst in terms of enforcement and looking into things like, uh, like slotting fees. Vegas, not so much. <laughs> or Miami. Or Miami, apparently. Yeah, Florida, yeah, Florida. <laughs> Party places. <laughs> um, now, the advantage of being a consultant is that if you are a, brand, a bar owner, now all of a sudden you can consult and come down to tails and work at a party for one of the liquor brands and you're only working as a consultant for your sort of fair market value. They're not paying you to have your, their product in your bar. They're not giving you anything that they can't necessarily give you. So the argument is you're coming down as a consultant to work tonight and, or, or potentially create a cocktail for, um, for them to use in house or to create as part of their PR campaign or whatever. Um, so here's where sort of the, ulti the end conclusion is the slotting fee part. Now that you know that paying for anything, placement, um, back bar placement, menu placement, whatever, is called a slotting fee and that is impermissible. So anything of value you, you can't technically give. So you should, work with, um, you should work with an attorney familiar with the industry to sort of figure out the gray areas because that's where everybody plays. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's Let's say you want to start your own brand, whether it's uh, you want to start a, be a brand ambassador, you want to start your own liquor brand, or you want to ultimately start a bar. All of these things are generally going to remain constant. You can form your own business, right? So um, the easiest probably is an LLC. That can just be you or a couple other members. Um, very easy, relatively inexpensive to form. Um, all of that income will pass through to your, your personal income taxes at the end of the year. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. An S-Corp is slightly different. In an S-Corp, you can um, sell shares as opposed to selling like equity in the LLC. So depending on how many investors you're going to take on or how many partners you, you're going to have, then you may want to consider an S-Corp. And the final one you might want to consider would be a C-Corp. And those have double taxation. So um, the, the C-Corp will pay the taxes. And then you as an individual owner will also pay taxes on the money that you earn. So that's why some people tried to keep an LLC or an S Corp. In the beginning, C Corps are generally preferred by the big companies if you're gonna be getting VC funding or taking on a lot of um, investors because it's a little bit more friendly to those the, the VC side. So uh, ultimately you need to speak to a lawyer or an accountant, but just to give you the very, very, very basics, LLCs are the easiest and C corps are the most complicated. And it depends on where you are. So for example, if you're starting your um, LLC in New York City, for example, it's actually extremely expensive because you have to publish that you, in a newspaper, that you have started this company and the New York Times is very expensive to advertise in. And you have to do like three publications unless you, there isn't one. So I started my, my, all of my businesses, I have a house upstate and that's where I started all my businesses because that 
I only had one paper and it was $18 to advertise that I started my company. But that's where the Nest Corp, you don't have to file that. Um, also, uh, just a little anecdote, my accountant likes S Corps because I put everything on my business card. So my Bullets and Bustles Incorporated, if you're not good at separating your own finances yourself, you can just get one credit card that's tied to that business. You put money in that account and you draft money out. If you have to hire a bar back or somebody to help you with an event, you pay them from that. Um, if it's over $600, you have to 1099 them at the end of the year. So a lot of things go back and forth, but it just depends on, I'm assuming San Francisco is probably also pretty expensive to start an LLC. So just look into those things. Things, um, and just figure out what's best, best for you. Yeah, it's like twelve hundred dollars for just for the publication alone in New York. So it's it's you know fairly expensive. <laughs> yeah. um, now the other part of it, obviously, if you're going to start a wh whatever it is you're doing, you may want to consider trademarking the name um, or the logo or, or potentially both. Um, obviously, you want to make sure that there's nothing else out there that's similar. So the the rule is um, likelihood of confusion. So obviously, you need to have an attorney or somebody assist you with it. But if there's another brand that has the same name as yours then it's probably a non-starter and think of another brand. The best trademarks are things that don't mean anything. So Google, Yahoo, obviously none of them meant anything initially. Um, if it's something that actually means something, it's a little, it could be harder depending on what the name is. So um, just think of that. If you're thinking of a name, try to come up with something that doesn't mean anything. Um, agreements, you're going to have tons of different agreements depending on the type of business. Obviously, if you're starting a, uh, a brand, we're going to talk about that. You're going to have certain agreements. If you're a consultant, you're going to have an agreement with Diageo, let's say, that you're going to want to review. Or if you're consulting with a bar, you're going to want an agreement with the bar. Like, who owns what? So um, if she's creating cocktails for somebody, does she own the cocktail? Or is she doing it as what would be us usually in like a Diageo agreement, uh, work for hire? And that they would own it if they paid for it. So you just have to consider what you want to own, what you care about owning, and then you know, have agreements and understand what it is that you're getting into when you do sign agreements with brands or bars. And we cannot express this enough. This is the most important thing and probably the hardest thing for everyone to do. I have been burned so much. Like, obviously, when I broke up with the chef, he got to keep all my drinks. It sucked. The next project I did, I had already been through that. I, was, I had my armor on. So when uh, Jim Kearns and I were forming an exit agreement with Rye House, we had an initial like, consulting thing. And it was just over email. It was not really a major official contract. But when we left, it, we were very specific about how they could use our cocktails, because a lot of them had become kind of new classics. We have this great drink called the Clarabeau, and we're like, you can use that, but only if our name's on it. You can only use, have an asterisk. So there's lots of different ways you can do it. But that's the stuff that's, you know, we're creative people, so that's the stuff like you have to really think like, what are you gonna be really upset if they use when you're gone? And, and your quality control and all of those different things. So really find it within yourself, like what matters to you. If they're using your name and those drinks are gonna be on there, but they decided, let's say they decided to switch out brands on you. Like be very specific about what that means because my drink, that Clarabeau, is perfect with bullet bourbon it gets less perfect with other whiskeys and that's what they try to do when we left. So they eventually pulled the drink because I actually um, went back in a few months later and they had sold the, the placement spot, probably not legally sold, but they were, they were putting something else they probably got a better deal on in its place and I asked them to pull the cocktail. And so they removed our names from the list because they didn't want to deal with me being a pain in the ass. So. Yeah, I mean, you just need to know, think about what you care about and, and make sure that you read the agreements before you just sign off. Like, yeah, this is cool. I want to get money from whatever brand. So just make sure you understand because if it's a great cocktail and you want to use it somewhere else for another program, uh, if they own it, you're sort of screwed. Um, the other part of it is uh, agreements we talked about a little bit. Know the rules. Obviously, if you're working as a brand ambassador and you're going out and doing tastings for somebody, theoretically, the brand should tell you what it is that you can and can't do in that particular state. But before you go out and do a tasting in a state where you can't actually conduct a tasting, you should probably just at least know for, you know, for yourself that you can actually do these things. Um, again, part of the agreement check is going to be that that brand indemnifies you or covers you for anything that you do wrong um, where they tell you it's okay. But you just should, you know, for yourself, you should know if what, if what you're doing is legal. So a lot of, um, you probably had a brand ambassador come into your bar and pay with some company name that looks nothing like their company they work for. A lot of brands work through agencies, so you end up being the employee of an agency. So that helps, that agency then takes on that liability. But when you go out on your own, um, I actually only just recently did it myself, was I got my own liability insurance because now every event that I work at, every place I'm serving, Bullets and Bustles Incorporated, which is me now, 
is responsible for all of those legalities. So things like if I overserve someone, I want to have like, or they overserve themselves. I don't want to be sued at the end of the day if someone was like, yeah, I just did four shots over there. And I'm like, oh, I didn't serve this to you. This sucks. Now I'm being sued. Um, that's where that liability insurance is really good for you. And you can email me later uh, or tweet me. I have a great person who does liability insurance. It's very affordable. So lesson at the end of the day is all this sounds like it's a lot of money to lay out, but it's a lot less money to lay all of this out now than it is to deal with a problem later. Yeah, definitely. If you get everything set up in the beginning, it all works very smoothly. But when you try to do it half-assed in the beginning and try to cover it at the end, that's when problems arise. And for insurance, I mean, you absolutely need to have liquor liability insurance. Um, obviously, wherever you're working for should have insurance as well, and you can get them to cover you potentially, and that would be part of an agreement. But you need to have, you know, at least general liability, property, personal injury. So if someone kills somebody that, you know, you're not personally liable, you should have that. Any entity you form, you should have some sort of insurance for that entity as well. So um, absolutely. Um, I, think, I think we covered this. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're good. So we'll just jump into the brand stuff and I'll, you know, pop in and out as needed. All right. So launching a brand, uh, you see some familiar faces there. I'm sure Simon Ford has been in a lot of your bars when he uh, was full-time for Preneur Card and was working for another company. But uh, he has now branched out to become the business of himself and, and have his own brand. And that's, I was just in his seminar um, right before this. And that's a really crazy, intense move. You're coming from the comfort zone of working for either a big corporation to being your own and where you're counting every dollar, every penny that you're spending, whereas it's like before I was like, oh, it's a disassociated person. Yeah, I have a budget and I have to manage that, but it wasn't your money. So this is where you get, where you're going to take the most risk and put yourself in the game. For sure. All right, Charles. Yeah, thanks. Cool. So so this has been a, a, an interesting adventure for me. Uh, we've been on uh, the market for uh, just about two and a half, three years now, but uh, we were fully uh, with I'm going to talk the, about the cocktail. The, yeah, let's, let's talk about this cocktail. I like oh, cocktails. So, <laughs> Te quiero infinito. Uh, so this is, um, so we wanted to talk about, at this point, we're talking about innovation. And so Crown Royal, um, Matt Peckman is here. It's one of my friends. He's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a classic brand, and, he, and they're starting to do some really cool innovation and taking something that's iconic and finding really new ways to innovate it. So that's what this next section is about. It's like becoming a creator of something cool. So this is kind of like a delicious old fashioned with this beautiful um, Crown Royal coffee still, whiskey, some Piac Sherry, mole bitters, like, you know, it's just, it's just good, simple. Again, this is our second stirred drink, so strong. This is a serious topic seminar. We're very serious here, so we take our booze seriously as well. That, that is a tasty beverage, Lynette. <laughs> awesome. So uh, when, when uh, Lynette picked this picture, and um, <laughs> it, it made me laugh when I saw it, it um, I, I enjoy the, uh, the title underneath my company name of world-renowned mixologist as much as my friend here uh, enjoys Esquire after his name. <laughs> um, but as Lynette said, this is, uh, you know, you get it with media all the time, and they say, oh, what do, you, what do you call yourself? And I say, the only time I use the term mixologist is when I'm talking to you, when I'm talking to the, the press <laughs> or the media, not, not to you, but, to, you know, because they love that, and, they, and, and that's, it gives them something, and it helps the consumer understand that uh, there is some definition between, uh, between the two things. But what I'd like to touch on today is really my experience with um, launching a brand from, uh, from an idea that literally started on a BevNap at the end of a shift, uh, and then bringing it to market. And um, like we'll, we'll hear when Gabe speaks as well, and like any of you know that, that manage bars, um, we, we are ideal people. Um, you know, we are, just by nature, we're a creative bunch. Um, we're, we're innovative, we're creating new cocktails, we have tons of ideas, whatever it is, you know, beautiful menu design. Uh, we have, uh, you know, th theories and thoughts about the way a bar should be laid out. Um, but we might not be on the back end the best business people, which is, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's, you need both of those things to be successful, as we know, for anyone that's, that's run a bar. Uh, we need to, you know, the t-shirts of the, the vodka pays the bills type thing. Um, <laughs> it's a, you know, it's um, all, all too true. And anyone that's ever paid a bill, uh, the vodka soda should be your favorite cocktail, although that has nothing to, you know. <laughs> 
fastest to make, highest profit margin, uh, drinks really quick. You, you know, you can have four or five of them responsibly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just throw in responsibly every once in a while and you're safe. Is that, isn't that right? That's why just every once a paragraph. Um, but, you know, so on, on, the, on the left side of that, though, um, what we are really good at as individuals is innovation. And brands are always looking to us for innovation. Um, what the big brands are great at is, is production. And, and that is kind of what we suck at. They're great at efficiency. They're great at figuring out how to, how to pinch pennies and make things cost a few cents less. Because when you are building a brand and when you are looking to bring something to, to market in a retail world, I don't care if it's a pair of jeans. Um, really, a bar is a brand. You are a brand if you're going out to be a, a brand ambassador. Like pennies count. Like when we, I mean, it's unbelievable when you're looking at things. You know, our labels cost 20 cents. And if we can get them for 17 cents, that is all three cents is massive when you're talking about thousands of bottles that you you hope to sell in the in the long run and between innovation and production is execution because we all have these great ideas in our head but most ideas never make it out of our heads and actually turn into anything so the first step is actual action and doing something with it and hopefully we, we can find some good tools here to then take that idea that is a spark in our head that we were taking a shower and we're like oh my god I just figured it out like we're gonna we have a there's a problem in the world and we're gonna solve it with cocktails um, and, and and been actually getting that and putting it into tangibly into someone's into someone's hand and that was a challenge it took us two years like I said of of, of an idea um, craft house cocktails man what a what a, uh, a concept to even talk to a room full of bartenders about like bottled <laughs> cocktails right and let alone talking to the consumers about but it started with a question at the drawing room before I, I even ran the aviary and um, guests would always ask us about uh, for recipes and be like oh this is this cocktail is great and I remember very specifically I had a regular uh, you know this is early on in the in the movement and I wrote our recipe for an aviation and gave it to him and uh, about a week later on a Friday night I got a call and someone literally handed me the phone during a Friday night shift behind the bar and it was like you have a phone call I'm like why are you giving me the phone it's Friday night shift <laughs> and it was it was this guest and they're like I'm having my party the aviation didn't come out quite right it doesn't taste like it did in the bar I'm like yeah neither did that bottle of wine that you had when you were in Italy last year and you bought a case of it and sent it back and you're drinking it on your back porch it's never gonna taste the same as it was in the vineyard regardless of that um, you know, I was talking. Yeah, that was it. Uh, <laughs> you know, but we at the end of that shift, one of the owners and I, um, and I, we had worked together for a decade. We, this is the seventh bar we had opened together. I was not only running the the the, uh, the drawing room, but I was the operations director for our whole um, uh, bar group, and and did uh, expansions and opened all the bars for him as well. We said, man, can we like figure out a way to, to get these cocktails to people at home? And that's really where the I idea uh, kind of uh, was spurred. Um, so we, we started to, to, to talk. We're like, man, there's, there's got to be a way we can do it. And um, he's a big idea person. He always sees the big picture. I'm very uh, more detail oriented and, 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 and deal well with, with those sorts of things. Um, and so where I started was was the fun part was like in my in my kitchen and like you know bought some graduated cylinders so I can get down to the milliliter exactly how much uh, how these cocktails would taste and started to look into ingredients and see what was available pasteurized juices and types of sugar that was available and different production processes that were available that's the stuff that we do well we make I make liquid taste good in a glass. I have no idea how to put it on a shelf and then make sure that people buy 10,000 cases of it and or even how to bring that business to fruition uh, in terms of all of the legal stuff that comes into it, all of the business stuff that comes into it, all of the contracts, the lawyers that, uh, that are part of it. Um, but any idea that you have, including whether it's yourself as a business or any of this, starts um, with a business plan. And it is not the fun part of, of <laughs> making anything. But if you're going to raise money, you need a strong business plan before you put it in front of investors. And it, maybe you don't. Maybe you have a friend who's like, I know you're a great bartender. I've got 25 grand. I'd like to throw it at you. And we want, because your, your bitters are so great. And we want, you know, let's produce these things. And because people are, somebody's going to buy them. And that, that might be the case. But while you're doing all the fun stuff and formulating this great idea that you have, kind of taking a step back and starting with a strong business plan and laying out some of these, these are just a few of the roadblocks and hurdles that I look back uh, with a little bit hindsight 2020. Uh, and we had some of these things in place. Um, 
but each of these points up here uh, are things to be thought about when you launch a business, not once it's rolling. Hopefully this business that you're thinking of is successful and gets somewhere, and the second a business starts to be s successful, everything changes. <laughs> I don't care if it is your twin sister that you are business partners with, Man, when money, a big pile of money is on the table, everything changes. And if you've ever been business partners with someone, it's, it, these are just things that you to do, do your due diligence and protect your, yourself, protect your, your, all the hard work that you've put into something and just start off on the right foot and it saves so much headache down the road because you've defined everything, you've laid it out, you've had a plan. And it's not the fun part. And this is really where you need to bring um, a lawyer into the mix to lay it out. Someone that does contract work, someone that deals specifically if you're doing with dealing with booze, there's a whole nother um, uh, set of issues that you have to deal with that's special from any other item. And, and, and you know, it's not your friends who might be doing bitters have it once they get it defined as a food stuff as opposed to an alcohol product have a much easier uh, route than we do when we're dealing with actual alcohol because of all the nonsense that came out the back end of prohibition that we're still dealing with um, in addition to the fact that um, opening up and selling in 50 different states is about as difficult and no joke as selling that you might as well go to Europe and open up um, all the countries in Europe because it, every state is like opening a, a different country overseas uh, as you go about these things. But a few of these things that we look at, um, you know, you want to think about your recipes, you want to think about um, how your business is, is broken up, uh, where's your money coming from, what, what is your job, uh, and, and really this is the point where you define your product and its, um, and, and its identity. Uh, if there's any one thing that with whatever it, it is that you may be wanting to develop, it's figuring out your direction and sticking with that course uh, and staying true to that identity. What, what is your brand? What are your three core values that define your brand? And making sure that that goes through everything that you do through your marketing, through your advertising. Does your packaging speak to those core values and sticking with it? it um, when you start to veer and get wishy-washy, it's very hard for your end user to digest. And if you don't know what you are, the person at the end of the road who's trying to buy your product is gonna have no idea what you are either. And so this is something that with, with our brand that from the texture of the labels to the way the cartons look, to any advertisement that we do, to any charity that we, we partner with, to the, the very retailers that we decide to sell in. We've turned retailers down. Costco came to us very early on and we said no. Uh, because it was the wrong, that's not where we wanted our, our image to be. We wanted to be positioned as a premium product. We didn't want to just go for volume straight off the bat and then somebody sees it discounted at Costco and then when they go to Whole Foods, it, it doesn't have the same, it's a, you know, in their mind have the same uh, image as in terms of that. Um, you know, with, you know uh, with all of this, when you're doing your business plan, um, you know, you're figuring out why is your product unique? Why are people going to buy your product? Who is your competition? Um, it's all really, really important. Uh, you know, you might think your, your product's a great uh, idea, and I'm, and I'm sure whatever, whatever's going on up there is brilliant, and I'm sure it will be delicious, but are enough people going to buy it to make you a, a viable business? Um, Kind of moving into uh, the real world problems that, that we, we did. Um, you know, we, we had talked and we were like, oh, do you open a distillery? Probably not. <laughs> like that is a massive amount of money. And our, our friends who have done it, like, you know, bless them, like especially those that are going from starting with grain and, and going into that as opposed to being rectifiers. Um, the, the simple licensing of opening a distillery and all of that is absolutely absurd. In my case, um, I wasn't interested in trying to produce spirits and so um, I was able to actually fourth time was a charm with our spirits uh, even sourcing our vodka and our gin uh, we worked with and finally landed with a small uh, Chicago based producer called CH uh, who we contract and they make th our vodka and our gin specifically for us for our, for our cocktails um, finding a production facility uh, was about a year process um, in, in our case, and this is where we basically batch our cocktails and bottle them. It's a co-packer is the, the term uh, that, that you use for that. But I, we couldn't find anyone in the entire United States that would do the process the way we wanted to do it. Everybody either, again, brand identity. I needed to always have 100% control over um, 
production ingredients and, and all of the quality type stuff. It is no different um, when we talk about brand ambassadorship. Uh, don't put your name on anything you're not proud of. Don't work for a brand you're not proud of and that you're, you're not sincerely proud of because people will see straight through that. And um, the, what we do have is a small um, uh, businesses and as individuals uh, is the fact that we we do have passion and we are we're very nimble and we can move quickly uh, and um, that is something that uh, big companies spend millions and millions of dollars on in innovation and there's a reason that they come and they buy small companies and acquire them and work them into their uh, into the fold because uh, more of those ideas fail from the big companies um, time and time again because they're coming from some brain trust somewhere of people that are not in the trenches and you're, you're seeing a real movement uh, and you see it all the time uh, where, where companies get, get brought in. We see, I mean, just um, all the time, uh, a lot of these ideas do not come out of, uh, they're, they're brought in, I think. Oh yeah, I mean, I think we've all seen like innovation that's terrible. I mean, I'm still shocked Fireball's doing so well, but like my, when I first, <laughs> when I first, yeah. I was like, oh God, this is like red hot some whiskey. This is my worst nightmare. G give me but 1% of that company. I know, but <laughs> I, I should have issues. invested. If they yeah. go public, maybe buy a percent. But you know, there's all those ideas that come through, I think innovation and you know, if you're lucky enough to have people who work in, you know, I actually work in the Diageo corporate bar and I'm, I actually, what's great is working that, in that bar we get innovation coming to us at the bar um, to ask us what we think about things. And that's a very unique um, position to be in. So they they're actually care what we're going to think about it. So they kind of pass ideas like, what do you think about that? I'm like, eh, oh, or, or this is awesome. You know, so that's, well, if you have opportunities and, and, and to taste things from brands, like be really honest with them too. Like if they bring you some like unmarked label, if Charles brings you something in, like it's not going to help. Like, yeah, you don't want to, you know, be like, oh my God, it's Charles sitting in my bar and he's asking me to taste something. It's amazing. You, there's a quote, you learn more from your criticism, uh, and this is Bill Gates, you learn more from criticism than you do from um, praise, essentially, that, because that's where you're going to really find out how to improve and, and to grow and make something that's... No fine. doubt, no doubt. I mean, you don't learn anything from, from getting it right, you know, you really don't, and that's hopefully what you can pick up from a little bit of the seminar today is that please learn from our mistakes because we've <laughs> we've fallen you know flat, flat on our flat on our faces i've had horrible consulting jobs where i've gotten burnt as well um you know i've i've opened bars and i've watched those you know some of those bars close and that's they're painful mistakes but they're the ones that you learn the most from uh and and we're you know we're taking our time and doing very responsible growth as well with with this business um, you know we, we look at some of the, the things that it takes once you have a product and once you've produced it uh, to make it happen uh, we have chosen the route of slow sustainable growth we've made a couple of decisions I may have taken back along the way, opening states where we weren't quite ready to support them. Uh, no offense to our, our distributor partners at all, but as a small company, um, you're essentially when you partner with the distributor, they're going to be a delivery service for you because they have so many brands to deal with. And so you really need to look after your own product. And so if you uh, can't support it in an area, then it's probably going to sit in the warehouse and not, it's not going to get pushed into a lot of places. For us, we also had a very uh, non-traditional uh, idea of how we wanted distribution. To us, success wasn't going into a state and being in a thousand um, liquor stores. It was being in 250 of the right ones, being on the, the, the the one on the corner that sells discount cigarettes or you know and like pickles in a plastic bag <laughs> is not where people are going to pay a premium price they're going to go pick up mudslide mix they're not going to be grabbing our stuff that they don't care that it's all natural they don't care that there's no preservatives they don't care that the you know the gin was actually distilled in a in a pot with real botanicals they you know they're buying a, a pickle in a bag <laughs> they're not spending the extra 10 bucks on, on our stuff and so that you know that distribution on an excel spreadsheet means nothing to me uh, if it's not if it's not moving and you in, you move into it moves into all sorts of, of problems as well um, but uh, it's not just put it in a bottle and then put it on the store shelf you do need to find distributors in, in each and every state we also had the offer to go national very quickly somebody offered to take us into a, one of the largest distributors in the multiple states and we we said no to that as well very uh, attractive carrot at the end of the stick but 
Um, all are not created equal and everyone's not as good in every state as, as someone. So kind of cherry picking and, and forming stronger partnerships and, and working with the right people in each state was right for us. But there's all sorts of little stuff hidden in there as well. Because once it's made, where do you keep it? Where do you keep your raw materials? Where do you keep your empty bottles until you need them again for the next run? Because you can't just go and buy a thousand bottles. You've got to buy a truckload of bottles and you might not produce that much. In our case, we have a perishable product. So we need to worry about it and think about it like more the way um, somebody doing a white wine or even a beer would, would have to um, think about uh, product rotation. So things like uh, that all come into play in the way that you plan out. Um. And just going on that point of expansion, um, Ivy and I deal with this a lot on Speed Rack. Like, we are really fortunate that there are so many people and so many countries that want us to come and bring an event that promotes women and raises money for charity. But if we can't quality control what's happening there, it dilutes your brand personally. So we don't want people to be like, oh yeah, went to Speed Rack, uh, you know, Aji Bajan or whatever. And they're like, oh, it sucked. There were like two girls competing. <laughs> you know, so we, we try to keep quality control. And that's really, it's, it's actually one of the hardest things at the end of the day is like how much control you can give up and how much control you need to keep. Um, and I think Charles' advice of like just taking it slow. I mean, four years of like waiting to really expand that we've only just expanded beyond the UK to Canada, and we will do more, but if we can't be a part of at least that initial seed to start it in some of these places, you know, it, it gets out there and then all of a sudden your brand is diluted or it just doesn't have the soul of what made it great. And I think that's where you have to be careful. And, and I think that is, um, that, like I said, going back to that, that is the, that is the strength, that is our, our, the biggest ace in the hole as a, uh, as a startup is, is the authenticity, is the passion, is the fact that that it is your kind of dream being realized or your creativity being realized. And so, you know, being able to keep control of that uh, is, is absolutely key toward continued success. Now, once you've got this all together, I am, I am telling you, and, and, and like it or not, um, once you, it all needs to be brought together with marketing. And really, uh, in the world today, it, it is, I don't care if you have, uh, the most uh, delicious, the most innovative, the greatest product in the world, if it's not marketed well, it is not going anywhere. Uh, there's just, it is, that is the, the long and short of it. Um, it not only needs to look good, the packaging doesn't uh, only need to look right, um, but where you end up and how it is perceived by the end user is, is really the ultimate. And any of our um, friends that work for it, and, and even the larger brands as well know it, and, and really it goes into, your cost does not go into the liquid in the bottle. That is a, a, a minimal cost, really, at the end of the day for any of the products that we buy. Uh, the, the jeans that you paid 100 bucks for, uh, like the cotton in those jeans didn't cost $100. It was, it was the marketing. It was the storefront that they went into. It's everything else that goes around it. The actual physical material costs very, very little relatively speaking and it cannot be and that carrying through that definition of your brand through to this is so important understanding what the hell the difference is between pr and marketing and advertising and why you need to pay these three different people and, <laughs> and understanding exactly what they do that's different from one another i still haven't quite figured it out but um we've had we've had some some really good success though again because we we have a real story behind it and it's been very easy for them and larger brands have looked and say well who's your PR company this is great like why haven't we been able to achieve these results it's like it's easier to because it's my brand it's easier to sell us as as people behind it as opposed to it coming down uh, the chain and you know Microsoft launching a new platform that, as opposed to a startup coming the other way uh, and doing something innovative in, in IT or whatever um, so I think Ryan's just going to give us a quick yes. legal wrap up on everything we just covered in Charles's wonderful speech. Uh, world renowned mixologist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say. Uh, so, super, super quick, um, so we can uh, get to Gabe. But basically, to start your own liquor brand, it's not all that complicated if you have the right team in place. Um, it's complicated, but it's not. We can sort of walk you through the entire process. You either need to be licensed or work with an importer or somebody else who has a license, but ultimately the person who has the label has to have a liquor license to manufacture a DSP or, or um, uh, some other license for wholesaling. Anyway, you have your license, you have your labels. Now you need to get it into the stores. You have distribution agreements. There's a shitload of things you can figure out in terms of 
working with one distributor in multiple states to leverage the multiple states or in one market, um, distributors are only trucks. Uh, work with somebody who knows the liquor industry before you do a bottling agreement or contract with anybody um, for distribution. And marketing, it's state by state. You need to know the rules in every single state to be able to get things right. And then you're off to the races and you can sell to whoever is the highest bidder. Just real quickly before we hand it off. So, I mean, honestly, the things that I could say to, to keep together, figure out what you're doing, put a business plan together and keep focused, just keep on the path that you intend to and stay true to whatever it is that your idea was. Build an awesome team that you can trust. And, and, and there are so many people that have already paved, don't make the same mistakes that other, other people have made. Um, you know, so you've got the great idea. Now you just need to find someone who has expertise and, and some money on the back end. And so find those mentors, find those partners who can, who can do that for you uh, to help make that a realization. Do what you're good at and then bring in the other pieces to, to you only know what, what you know and, and bring in the people that know what you don't to help you kind of get to that end point. Yeah, unless you went to business school, like I think it's just kind of, a re that's really a great point. There's so much to learn and you know, I've even personally like learned a lot and it's hard to know like when you're starting a company and you're putting your own money in and you're trying to figure it out, just think about those things that you can when you're starting to bring money in, what the smart hires are and where to expand. Uh, and I think that's pr a really key thing is know what you don't know and pay for it if, to make it right. And now we're going to move on to, so this is great. I mean, these are, I'm inspired by you guys today. These are bartenders who I've looked up with and, and had the opportunity to kind of grow with. And um, what Gabe is doing is something that's really incredible, something that's terribly hard. If you think making cocktails for people is difficult, wait till you deal with their food. Um, if any of you work in restaurant bars, it's the worst. man, I'm so picky. <laughs> like, it, it is the worst. It's, it's, it's so, this is a really interesting. Um, way to be and it's it's also great that um, in this day and age restaurants have finally and, and all of the food uh, magazines are starting to understand that cocktails are part of this conversation and we're a really big part because at the end of the day if that chef I worked with years ago would have known I can help make money that you can then put into ingredients it's not me taking your glory it's I'm helping you make your product and I can keep your restaurant afloat actually at times so uh, Gabe Orta yeah, I agree. Maybe we should do a pickle in a bag. Kind pickle in a bag. Like that. That's a great concept. <laughs> um, and we're I love pickles in a bag. <laughs> I, I love pickles anyway. Um, our next cocktail is coming out. Uh, Gabe is, lives in Miami, and so I cannot think of anything better than to serve a delicious rum cocktail uh, that this signature old fashioned was created by Julio Cabrera, who is amazing. If you get time to meet him as well, he's a, a pioneer in this industry, has been around for a really long time, but still bartends. He's a great career guy to talk to. Um, so we're going to have our Zacapa Signature Old Fashioned. Um, it's with grapefruit, mole bitters, um, Angostura bitters, a little chocolate, just for our little decadent moment. And it really just brings out the flavor. So here's to our final, it's coming around, but we're going to have our final stirred, dark, strong drink. And we're going to talk about the restaurant business. Sounds delicious. <laughs> so yeah, pretty much, um, you know, I was bartender uh, for many years. I started with my business partner, Elad. Uh, we're, we're bartenders in, in bars and kind of through bartending we decided to open a consulting company same way we work with different brands with the events cocktail menus in different places but uh, like like uh, everybody agree in this room you know you're not there the whole time so you see your brand start diminishing when you when you leave and and it becomes like your name is attached to the cocktails attached to the program so your brand starts to diminish and especially in Miami as a city is not, is not known for, for cocktail programs. So, you know, working in this bar, we, we, we kind of decided we're like, we need to open our own bar. Kind of that's where like our passion was. Uh, I've always been big into food, into cocktails, you know. So kind of, we wanted, this was our dream to open the bar. So, you know, we're, we pretty much agreed that we, every person that we would meet at the bar, we kind of were given our idea. We had an idea put together in our head and a piece of paper, same way we wrote down in a, in a, in a napkin. <laughs> Actually, it was a received. We wrote down kind of the concept. We're like, okay, you know, why not? Like, so every person, we're like, every person comes into this bar. We worked at, at a lobby bar in the W Hotel in, in, in South Beach. So it was a lot of people with money, high end. 
So every person that we see in our bar, we would tell about our business plan. Everybody was into what we were doing. And uh, so little by little, we start having a lot of people meeting, and people are like, yeah, we'll give you money. We'll throw some money. What much you guys need? You need 100000 You need a million? We're like, oh, my God, we're going to open three bars. This is amazing. <laughs> so we we're, were super happy. We meet this guy from New York, like really wise guy. Like, yeah, I got you guys money. Don't worry. I got you. We're like, perfect. Like, so like, we got it. So we go to meet a... We go to meet a, a real estate guy, a developer that has all these properties in Wynwood, which is a place in Miami, it's kind of up and coming, a, a neighborhood that was starting to develop. So the rent was cheap. So we see $9 a square foot, that's perfect. That's like, that's right, the rent is gonna be cheap. We got an investor, he told, he agreed, you know, he told us, oh yeah, I'm gonna give you $500,000. Perfect, we're like, this guy is golden, we got <laughs> cheap rent, we're good to go. So then we, our mistake and the many mistakes that we made that we didn't have a, a legit business plan. And we had our idea, we talked to investors, we talked to the, to the, the real estate guy and you know, everything seems to come together. But as the, the time goes by, as the neighborhood starts to go up, uh, the square foot starts to go up, the investor was kind of a little weird and he starts <laughs> to change our concept from a cocktail bar to a strip joint. So we're like, okay. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, so it's kind of kind of weird. So and and right and when we're like ready to pull the trigger and to and to have everything, we realized like you know what we need the right business plan. So we got together with a lawyer. We wrote down what we really want, and that's and, and kind of that goes back to doing your homework. You have to see how much they exactly what your what your venue is, what your concert you want to do. It's either a cocktail bar, a speakeasy, a restaurant put it all together, put the numbers, do the homework, how much the rent is gonna be, how much the equipment, we, we, we buy, we like, oh, let's get a, let's do some tacos and grill some food. The hood itself is $80,000. The liquor license in Miami is $180,000. So just to, we realized just to open a small cocktail bar like we wanted, we had to spend about $700,000. And on top of that, because there was a neighborhood that was up and coming, the, there's a, uh, a lot, it's called impact fees. When you convert a warehouse to a, to a food and beverage, the government gives you an impact fee just to convert it, then it gives you another impact fee if you want to change the sewage because you have to change the sewage for bathrooms and like in, in grease trap. So that right there's another $80,000 we didn't see coming. So our business plan became <laughs> from having like a $250,000 uh, bar to becoming 800, almost a million dollars. So when we do our numbers, this doesn't make sense. We're gonna open a, 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 cock, a small cocktail bar, 1,500 square foot the most, and spend a million dollars, we'll never make the money back. You know, so, so we kind of were very upset, we kind of lost all hope. We're like, all right, we're just gonna like, we're just gonna become a brand ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> Don't knock it till you try it, babe. <laughs> so, so, so and then uh, and then <laughs> we knew these guys and so we kind of you know what let's flip her around we knew these guys from new york that they started the ace hotel they started the nomad a great company so it's called sidel group and they're up and coming company and a friend of ours worked for them and they bought this property on on the beach uh, like kind of open another <laughs> up and coming uh, neighborhood on on miami beach and they bought this pro this uh, boutique hotel when we approached them yeah, they didn't know what they wanted to do with them. So we kind of, we already have the business plan of our concept with the name and we approached them, we're like, listen, we have this concept, we don't have any, we, we can't prove ourselves because we haven't opened a business yet, but this is our concept, <coughs> give us $50,000, we're gonna use that money to buy the liquor, to do decorations, and we're gonna give you money, that money back in a month, <coughs> and we're gonna do a pop-up bar for, six, for five months, the tops. So they like the idea, they start projections, our projections is to make $250,000 for, for six months. We gave them all the projections, uh, how much money we're gonna spend. They like the business plan, they, it, was a, it was a low risk for them. They didn't have to spend that much, they only have to give us $50,000 and, we'll and we agree in the, in, the, in the agreement that we're giving back to them in, in within a month. So they have nothing to lose. So we knew we were gonna kill it and that, and that goes back to, the, to your business plan. Like, just the passion, you know, like have all the numbers ready, have everything ready, you know you're gonna do good, do your homework, you know what kind of food you're gonna sell, how much you're gonna do at night, we will go to bars and we kind of like see, okay, this bar is making 
$1,000 in a Monday night, and then on Fridays and Saturdays, they make $4,000 on Friday, $5,000. So we kind of got our numbers together throughout the week, so we know how much numbers we're gonna make each month. The rent, equipment, staff, marketing, all these things that go, that go into place. And, and long story uh, short, the, this, the pop-up bar became an instant success. Within the city, we made the money that were projected for four months, we made it within two months. So this, uh, this group, the Seidel group, was, was, they were really taken by it, and they started seeing us as a potential partners. And then that's when we got to a lawyer. Now we, like they, they approach us, like, you know what? We want to be partners with you guys. You guys prove yourself that you can run a legit business. Uh, it's very successful. So we got with lawyers. We, we got our agreement. And you know, when you're going to do an agreement with a company like that, you always want to, you know, it's a, it's a big corporation. So you always want to take money from the top, you know, like uh, money from the top. So I wait, and then money from the bottom, because they're not going to let you take money from the top all the time, because, you know, you, they want to see the revenue. They want to see the, they want to see their investment paid off. So it's, it's about the deal you make. It's about, you know, the lawyer that you have, and you get a good deal that makes sense for them and makes sense for you. You know, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, you are the brand. You are the brand and, and you are the one that's gonna have the passion. They're, they're giving you the platform to shine and, and you're gonna have that platform to like really make a success. And, in, in, and then when we got there, um, you know, we, we give them all the, all the business plans, what's the roles, what, how much the staff is gonna, you know, how much we're gonna spend on payroll, how much we're gonna spend on, on expenses, all these things put together, we signed the deal. And, and from there, we were permanent. We were a permanent bar, but we became, you know, the broken shaker. And, and everything, starts, everything starts to get like, you know, like a, legit, like a legitimate business. But the main thing is to, you know, I can, we can stress it enough. It's we to wanted to bring this slide back because it really is at the core of all of these other ventures. Business plan. This right. is the key part. And then I think we're going to get into some of the other uh, really important things like shares and investment and voting rights and right. all of these issues that are really key when you're getting in big groups like this. Um, so, Right. And, uh, and for me, I had a business partner. We're bartenders together. So first, we made our, our agreement together. I, my best friend, we work together, but now we're becoming business partners. So it's a completely different story. Now, that, now there's money involved. Money changes everything, you know, like you're, you're busy, you're like, you don't want to, you don't want to deal with this person anymore. You're like, you know, become from best friends to hate each other. Yeah, in and a Ju way, uh, you know? Julie Reiner actually gave this like advice. You plan for the worst, plan that you're going to hate each other. And that's what you write, like you're, you're preparing for the divorce and it's the saddest thing, but right. you know, it's the hard, and it's the hardest conversation I think to have, but it's the most important thing to do. It's like, Hey, how about if you just decide you're going to like, Gabe's like, ah, I'm out, I'm going, I'm, going, I'm going away, I'm gonna move to another country and do this, and then your other partner's like, well, you're gonna leave me with the entire business? So you right. need to know what those, those exit agreements look like, what the partnership looks like for future growth and where you're gonna be, and that's a really important and difficult conversation to have with maybe if you're getting, especially when you get a business with friends. Yeah, and especially like, you just gotta be black, uh, black and white, everything put on paper, what are your roles, what are you gonna do, you know, what do each other bring to the business, what are you gonna do? What's the money situation? Once you have the agreement with your partners, then since we're bringing this other company to kind of support us, to kind of give us the backing, then we have another agreement with them. You know, for us, we started, we couldn't afford, we, you know, we thought it, the, the, the bar was gonna do a certain amount, of, uh, we thought it was gonna do $1.5 million a year, so we couldn't, doing our numbers, we can really afford three, having three, four managers. So we were the managers at first. We managed the place, we bartended a couple of nights. So, you know, for us, we had to have a, 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 man, a management agreement that it pays us as a, manage, a, a management fee, you know, kind of to heal on payroll and to have a, a profit uh, fee. And that's something so, that uh, when you get into these deals, it's something that they will try to skirt always. Right, absolutely. But they do not want to pay. They're like, whatever, you have equity, that should be good enough. It's, right. It takes a really long time to see your percentage at the end of the day. You can't live on whatever percent they're giving you right now. And you're not, you know, even though you're eating and drinking at the restaurant, whatever, that's not gonna pay all of your bills, not gonna pay your rent. So this is a really important factor to put in and, and be very wary of any agreement where you're sweat equity only. Yeah, and, uh, and, and you guys know, like, 
you're going to be living in the bar, you're going to be closing, you're going to be bartending. It's pretty much going to be your life. So it's not really an amount you can put in, in this. You know, it's something you just kind of have to figure out the numbers. You know, go out to them, put in a lawyer, get different, different opinions. I got two lawyers that kind of give me different backgrounds and with their lawyer, and we, and we get into an agreement together that this is our management fee, this is our profits, this is a fee. And when it comes to a big corporation, big money, you don't really get your, you get every, you get every three months, you, get, you see your profits. So you always gotta put them to consideration. You're not gonna get paid, you know, in our case, we don't get, you know, we're not gonna get paid every month or every week. You get paid like well, quarterly. So that's another thing to put in consideration. And then, and then after that, after you, you find your contracts, then you know you kind of like the proof is in the pudding, and you know like all the insurance, all these other things that go into consideration. And then uh, so after after we signed the deal, everything was everything was money pretty much. Where you know you get going, that's when you really start you know to really find like places that they're successful and they're they're at, like pretty much the hard part. They, sorry, the easiest part is to open the place. So all this is the easiest part. <laughs> all this struggle went for three years. Well, oh, this was pretty easy. The hard part is to really run it and run it like a legitimate business that makes profit and they're successful and it goes with, like, with, with what you're trying to do. So, you know, like that's when really what your message is trying to send is, is what you really want to emphasize, what your message is to your staff to the consumer that's coming, to the different brands that want to support you. What is your message? What is your, what is your branding? And it's very important, like what your branding is. Like, you know, when I was bartending, I, I didn't, you know, I, you know, I didn't care. I, w I didn't have a brand, but now that I'm, I'm a business owner, it's a completely different story. Like now we have a brand, we have a message to tell our staff. And, you know, and it all comes down, you know, like you guys know, hospitality, like the, the drinks, you know, like everything service, everything that has to do with like having a legitimate business because you want to keep those profits, you want to keep your investors. At the end of the day, your investors want to be happy. So, so pretty much we, we really focus on the, on the product. That's why we really focus on, you know, like we really focus on bringing the best product, local farmers, having you know all all the things that are really going to make the the business really really successful and and have some longevity and and after you know after we realized we saw that that the business was very successful we decided to you know one of our other dreams was to open a, a restaurant and and the restaurant part you know it was really our first restaurant you know i i managed other places i, I cooked in a lot of kitchens i always wanted to be a chef but once we opened this restaurant, we've been open for about eight months, and um, and the the and the shaker was the food, but it was a, a small little kitchen. But we decided to open a restaurant, and then that is a that's another set of problems, <laughs> because you know one thing that uh, the the um, Tony Abogano always told me is like, and I and it always stuck to my head. It's like you see, and I, when you when you when you're in a bar, if something goes wrong, if somebody has a, a shitty service. You open, you're offering shots, you're offering a couple of drinks, and everybody goes home happy. When somebody's in a restaurant, they have bad service or bad food, they will never forget and they will never come back. <laughs> At least I'm one of those, I'm the worst. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, forget, I'm never coming back here. So it's really, it's a, a really thin line, how you like gonna like make that your message, how you're gonna carry your food. So it all starts from the beginning, like, it all starts really empowering your staff and doing just pre-shifts and you know your your chef tasting everything. It's really uh, it's a really it's completely different and uh, and it's really challenging and you know like everything goes fine for a week and I come back and everything's a <laughs> shit show again. It's like what happened? <laughs> and and Gabe is gone for a week because they have just opened as of June first was it or right. recently Broken Shaker in Chicago, which. <laughs> Thank you. He's a franchise now. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so that's a different, another topic of itself. But pretty much uh, with the success of the Broken Shaker, 
the, the, these guys, they own the, the hotel, which is called the Freehand. They bought a property about two years ago in Chicago, and they, asked, they, they told us we want to do, a, we wanna do a, a Freehand there. So we went to check it out, we went to sell a property, and uh, you know, I, I've been to Chicago before. I had many friends that moved there, but it was before I was really into the hospitality business. So I went two years ago, and while I'm there, I'm like, you know, I, I was kind of iffy about it because this is my brand, this is like my baby. I don't, I didn't want to let it go. You know, I was like, no, like, you know. So while I was there, you know, like I, I realized like Chicago has the best, tick, one of the best top three uh, tiki bars in the country. One, one, the best, if not the three best molecular bars, you know, really innovation. The best dive bars, classic. <laughs> it's really a city that's in the best food. So we're kind of like, this is a no-brainer. This is a no-brainer. We, we, it's opportunity pretty much handing out to us. You know, so we're like, okay, let's do it. So, but for us, was really a key to bring the vibe that is in Miami. Miami, you're outside, you're in a pool. You have all these tropical flavors. We have this garden where we grow everything. How are we going to bring that vibe back into Chicago? How are we going to how are we going to relate that message to our staff? You know, like you know. So it was that was like a whole ch uh, their challenge that that we had in hand. And and I think one of the things through through like opening the the bar and the restaurant, I really got into like design and how to design bars uh, bars properly. And I, I had a, a girlfriend, and she was like, back in the day, she always like, was like a, a designer. And I was like, why are you putting this porcelain here? Like, <laughs> I always give her so much trouble. And then once I started on, once I opened the business, I really got into it, and I really, you know, got into like, you know, everything is a whole package at the end of the day. When you have, you know, like, the cocktails are easy. We're all like, we're all so creative. We're into drinks, we're into hospitality. That's the easy part. When, you go, when I go into a, a place that's memorable, I'm gonna look at the lighting. How's the music? How is the, how is the design? How's the bar inside? How's the, all these little things is what really makes, you know, places like memorable and what makes them like a successful place. All these little details. So it's all very important, all these little details. You know, writing down. I go. I, I get. I go to New York to get inspired. Just I just go there and walk around the city all day. Just because oh, New York is one city that everybody, the smallest little bar is just top of the game. Like from design, from service. So all these little things is really what's gonna set you apart and what's really is what really made the difference. And uh, and in and, and going to you know going to a new city that we're now there. The key was to bring, you know, we didn't want to bring a Miami bar to Chicago. Chicago is so much passion. People are so proud of their, where they're from. They love it. They, they go through the winters and they, and they, to this crazy winter. I've never been, i never experienced such a crazy thing. Like, you know, coming, from, you know, so we didn't want to bring that. We want to like, we want to like empower that culture. And so we got the food and beverage, you know, our main guy who's the food and beverage director. He's from Chicago our head bartender slash mixologist from Chicago. We wanted, like, we wanted to, to bring that city and to grow organically, kind of how we did uh, in Miami. We, grow, we grew very organically. We wanted to do it in Chicago in the same way. We wanted to em em emphasize in this amazing culture they have there. So, you know, so far it's doing great. People get the message and, and people see how, like, the vision we're trying to, we're trying to accomplish. Okay, I want to make sure we get questions from the group because, yeah. I mean, I've got tons of questions for these guys. So we're going to hand that mic off to, to our lovely assistant, John Smolensky. Hi. Hi. Um, raise your hand. Oh, we have someone back there. All right. The guy with the poker face. Hi. Um, Lynette, you did this on your own. Yes. But from what I gather, Charles and Gabrielle had access to capital right from the beginning. Uh, one had a uh, partner who he had worked with for years, who was the owner of his, the group of restaurants and bars that he worked for. And the other one made a deal with a hotel company. Um, it seems to me that you've over, the two of them overcame the largest problem that we all face, access to capital. 
Uh, isn't this a serious uh, issue? Yeah, I would. Uh, my partner didn't have any money. He owned bars. <laughs> um, we, Not a profitable yeah. business. No, to be quite honest, it was. Um, so uh, our first uh, tranche was um, definitely. I think you often find money from people you know that are that are willing to in, invest some small amount. We started with a very. Uh, very humble amount of, of, of money and, and got to a really good point from that. Uh, we were fortunately sustainable um, and, and not, not bleeding um, early on, so it got us through. And we just, uh, we just had a re-approach and are actually reworking our entire structure to, to make some, some bigger moves now. And um, so once you have a business that's running successful, is it really, I think, the same in Gabe's? Uh, uh, position, then you then attract the attention of, of other people that will come along and then help support it to the next level. Of course, you're going to give something up. No one, you know, once you, if you're going to bring in more capital, then you're going to give up something as well. So it is, um, finding money is not easy, but there is plenty of, plenty of it out there. There are plenty of people that make horrible business decisions every day. <laughs> we see more stuff, you know, people throwing stuff at the wall and and horrible ideas that fail constantly um, and so if um, if we can take a good idea and have a good business plan those are going to help you attract the investors to come and, and spend with you as opposed to you know some bar down the street from somebody that's doing it because it's always been a fun idea and personally I am terrible at asking for money from people um, when it well in a different way I was going to get to that I was going to get to Sidey my partner in speed rack um, <laughs> When it comes to myself, like when, so something for me, like my bar with Jim is probably the most personal thing I will ever do. And it's the hardest thing for me to ask people for money for. Because I'm sure at some point there's that fear in the back of my head being like, oh, what if it fails? Oh, then you failed and you fail these people. Now when it came to uh, Speed Rack and for us, you know, we, we came up with this idea and decided to go for it. Like, and we decided, we're like, all right, we're going to throw this test competition between Manhattan Kato Classic and Tails when no one has time to pay attention to us. So we, we were like, all right, we're going to ask all of our friends. And our friend Brian Miller uh, was a brand ambassador for Tank Ray. He's like, yeah, we've got some money for it. And we asked Rob Coom from St. Germain. I'm like, Rob, help us out. Like, help us put this on. It's going to be really small. And we were able to get funding. But until we proved ourselves, and I think that's a really good point, I think all of us kind of have that thread. Until you prove yourself, you, you don't, people are like, oh, yeah, whatever there's going to be. And now they're like, oh, we can't wait to be a part of it. When can we talk? And we're like, oh, give us a break. We just finished our national finals. We need to sleep for a minute. Um, so that it, it does take time to prove yourself. It is a hard thing to ask people for money. And we are all creatives in a lot of ways. And we are putting our personal artistic work out there. And it's probably the hardest thing to offer to anyone and ask to support it. Any other questions? Oh, oh, oh. And then these ladies over here. Ryan, my question's for you. Um, I have a company that does multiple things, consulting, and I plan on doing startups for bars uh, and owning bars. Is there uh, an advantage of taking uh, filing for an S-Corp versus like a series LLC, which is like an umbrella LLC? I would say you have to talk to an accountant and a lawyer in your state to figure out for your particular, basically the answer is I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. We have to figure out the actual facts of the situation. So typical lawyer answer, we need a little more details. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we, we, I'm happy to help you out after if you have a few questions and um, we can run through. And I mean, just from the outside look, it sounds like you have two different companies and it probably would behoove you to separate those out just from what I've learned talking to accountants. Because if one part of that business fails, you don't want it to come back on the other one and there's, you know, you can have 20,000 That 000 is absolutely notes. true. You want yeah. <laughs> Right? I mean, that's, I mean, in my business, I'm like, this is my company that does this, and this is what does that. And it just seems to be cleaner at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah that's exactly what I do. The, the bar, it runs to a different company, and then my consulting runs to a different, different name. And then when you do taxes, you just put them together, and that way you don't get that much taxes at the end of the year. Okay. And then these ladies had questions, I think. Run faster, John. <laughs> We're going to go over a couple minutes. Sorry. 
Um, as you guys have graduated and become successful people and individuals, how much of your time do you find you're managing other people versus having contact with the things that got you involved and in being excited about these businesses in the first place? I think Dave's gonna take this What one do you first. do to get inspired to like inspire your staff and those pre shifts and to get them as connected to the love of what got you involved in the first place? Yeah, uh, pretty much the whole uh, food and beverage about babysitting. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty much what you do. You're babysitting everybody and you have the, the one person you know, that doesn't get the, the vibe. But I think for us, what we'll be able to achieve is that, you know, a perfect example, our, our, bar, our, our bar manager started as a bar back, our, our chef right now started as a buzzer, and, you know, and so on, all the bartenders started as a bar. So we always try to get people involved and try to feel like the, the owners and give them ownership. One of our bartenders, we made him a partner in the, in the business. So, you know, we want people, we have an open door policy that anybody can come in and give us ideas and kind of feel part of the team to feel people motivated. And you're gonna have the people that are not into it. They're, they're just, it's, a, it's a job for them to pay the bills and they go home and in and out. And that's fine, that works perfect because they do their job. And, but you have, you're gonna have those people that they're so passionate, you see it from the start. You know, like, like Lynette, they hunt you down. Like, I want a bartender, I want a bartender. Oh, you want a bartender? You be a barber for six months. <laughs> I'll do it. So those people, the, the ones you're gonna nourish and kind of like take it under your arm and really empower them. And, uh, and, and those are the, the people you want around you. Like one thing like, you know, always surround yourself with people better than you and like, and let them run with it. That's kind of our slogan. And I would say like right now, I mean, Ivy and I are at the point where, um, you know, she just opened her bar, so that's kind of like her having her baby. And now we're like, oh, we have other things going on in our lives. What do you do? And you know, um, two years ago, we hired uh, Cooper Cheatham from Double Barrel Consulting. And you know, every year you're able to give more and more responsibility. So we're, you know, we're heading to working with him for three years in a row. And now we know he knows how we do business, and so like we can start giving him more of the U.S. and and hire him an assistant to make the U.S. happen. So Ivy and I can focus on really the, the rest of moving the business and getting it out to the rest of the world. But we also look to people in uh, different countries in uh, Canada. We worked with Lauren Moat, who has those fantastic bidders, and, and Danielle Tatarin, because they had the same passion for building Speed Rack in their community. And, we, and they know their city better than we do. So we were able to work with them and find people who we can then become our brand ambassadors and work with us uh, to, to spread. And then you have a question. Um, about four years ago, I put together a cocktail program, the first craft cocktail program in this tiny little town. And uh, when I first looked into, when I first contracted with the restaurant owner to do this, um, I talked to my attorney and I was told at the time that you can't copyright recipes. And so I had no contract really going into this and then I got burnt really bad. And now we're, we're look, me and my partner are looking at doing our own our own concept, but um, I know I can't go back and take those recipes <laughs> back, but what they've done to my cocktail program has been pretty detrimental to me since I've left. And um, I'm just curious, does that change state by state or? Are they still using your name on the menu or is it just because of your past relationship? <sighs> Both. Okay. It, it depends on what you're talking about. It's, I mean, I put together their entire I mean, I'm always a big fan of just writing a very legally worded sounding cease and desist to see if they flinch. Because <laughs> a lot of people like just get cease and desist and like, oh, I'm like, I just wrote it. And like, it scares people off. Like Ivy and I have people ripping off speed rack all the time or using photos of our girls. And we're like, oh, we had this very official sounding cease and desist. No lawyer really wrote it. Yeah. But, but they get scared and they immediately take it down. So there's some ways, but Ryan could probably give you more information. This is our last question too. But um, do rate, if you like the seminar, please rate us as uh, on this thing here. <laughs> I, w I would just say that a copyright trademark, all of that aside, it really would come down to the agreement that you had with the people. And if you were hired to do a cocktail program for them, probably it would be work for hire and they would own it. So you going back to the beginning and making sure that in the agreement you have with them, you outline that you own whatever it is that you produce. I think what about the Ryan, name and name? And it's trademark. It's only as good as well, it's a whole other issue. If you can trademark the name of the recipe and you can protect it and control it, then sure. The same thing. You have to patrol your trademark and go after them if they use it. Yeah. But we can talk yeah. after. Yeah. I mean, if you have, we can, we can. Uh, Charles, did you have something to add to that? 
All right, well, thank you everyone for coming here today. I hope it was <laughs> useful. And